to strike the keynote for the symposium, I invite Dr. Uma Dashgupta, based in Kolkata. She is an internationally recognized historian and biographer, a much sought after Tagore scholar. She is highly respected for her sensitive and in-depth research. She has written several books on Tagore, including the one in, uh, and a biography. Just recently, she participated in Tagore programs in London, London, Edinburgh, and Glasgow. I invite Umadi to strike the keynotes for our tribute to Rabindranath Tagore. Namaskar. Rabindranath Tagore, citizen of his country and of the universe, is going to be a life sketch, but obviously with great brevity. My focus will be on his relationship with his country and with the universal. I'm honored to be here, and I'm most grateful to the organizers for this very kind invitation. Robindranath was born in 1861 and died in 1941. He grew up in Jorashako House, the Tagore family mansion in the heart of Calcutta. That's a, an image of the house as it is today. Robindranath's family moved into Calcutta with the fluctuating fortunes of the East India Company. They left their inherited priestly duties as high Brahmins to become brokers to the European merchants in banking, insurance, and plantations. The family could boast of the first Indian independent merchant, independent Indian merchant, who was Rabindranath's grandfather, Dwarkanath Tagore. And there is an image of him. Among other pioneers in the family, there were venturesome landholders, free-thinking reformers, Sanskrit scholars, polyglots, a high civil servant, a first woman novelist, not to forget a world poet, which is him. Rabindranath wrote, quote, there was something remarkable about our family. It was as if we lived close to the age of pre-Puranic India through our commitment to the Upanishads. Along with that, there was a genuinely deep love of English literature among my elders. Shakespeare and Sir Walter Scott had a strong influence over our family. He also wrote, my father cherished a synthesis of Hafiz and the Upanishads in his heart. At 17, Rabindranath was asked by his father to go to England to study law. He returned without doing law, but in tribute to the English family he stayed with, he wrote, I received no shock calculated to shatter the original framework of my life. Rather, East and West met in friendship in my person. On returning home, he became immersed in writing. By the age of 30, he became a well-known poet 
writing in his mother tongue, Bengali. His first chance of finding himself independently came in the decade he spent from 1890 in rural East Bengal, where his father sent him to manage the family's agricultural estates at Shilaidaho, Kaligram, and Potishar, all now in Bangladesh along the river Padda. There he came into intimate contact with the common man's struggle for survival. The letters he wrote stand out as landmark creations from that period, as do his short stories. The letters were published in 1912 as Chinnopatra fragments in English. We also know from his writings that the turning point in his compassion for humanity came out of this first-hand experience of the miserable condition in which the majority of his countrymen lived. He wrote, I began to feel ashamed of spending my days simply as a landlord, concerned only with my own profit and loss. So I began to think about what could be done. I did not think helping from outside would help. I began to try and open their minds towards self-reliance. In 1905, he joined the Swadeshi movement against the imperial decision to partition Bengal on communal lines, but withdrew from it when it broke out into communal riots from within the movement. He wrote some powerful essays for his country's social reform. His drama, Ochulayatan, The Immovable, addressed the obduracy of Hindu orthodoxy. His novels, Ghore Bairi, Home in the World, and Gora, attacked the corrupt corrupting Hindu influence on Swadeshi politics. Pledging never to join a political movement, he decided to turn to education as the only way to mold people's minds. He began his experiment with self-reliant village development among the Hindu and Muslim tenants of his family's agricultural estates, those in rural Bengal that we have mentioned earlier. He set up cooperatives to take charge of literacy for all, also for development of local industries, community health care and recreation, safe drinking water, model farming, collective paddy stores, domestic industry-based work for women, campaigns against drinking of liquor, and solidarity among the villagers. And all this is documented. There are records to show that some of this work was well on its way in the early years of the 20th century. Rabindranath's nationalist critics accused him of desertion.
during the period 1894 to 1900, when he was so completely absorbed by the stark reality of the life of the common people, his poems expressed a certain inner mysticism. One such central poem was Jibon Devota, God of Life. In Jibon Devota, he gave expression to an inner sense of divinity that inspires and guides him. Through this experience, he confessed to a gradual moving away from institutional religion, believing that no mediation is needed between oneself and God. In his book, The Religion of Man, he cited a Baul song that he loved. Temples and mosques obstruct thy path, and I fail to hear thy call or to move when the teachers and priests ang angrily crowd round me. We've heard early on about the bowels as the wandering minstrels of Bengal. Uh, they, they are born without creed, they are completely unconventional, and in their songs which they sing in the country, um, they proclaim that the highest agency is human. He also wrote in the religion of man, from the time when man became truly conscious of his own self, he also became conscious of a mysterious spirit of unity which found its manifestation through him in his society. In a Gitanjali poem he wrote, he is there where the tiller is tilling the hard ground and where the path maker is breaking stones. He is with them in sun and in shah and his garment is covered with dust. Put off thy holy mantle and like him come down on the dusty soil. This is Tagore's Rabindranath's own translation, it's poem number 11 in the English Gitanjali. William Radice, I'm sure, has done his, his own translation of the new, um, of the, of the Gitan his new translations of the Gitanjali. There were various stages in the development of Rabindranath's humanism. His sense of deep ecology for man and nature gave him his most persistent drives in life, which were to bring joy and alternative values to urban education, to build a cooperative society in close touch with the land, to rededicate ourselves to India's unity in diversity, in combination with Asia and to lead the West towards the self-realization of the world. It was in Shantiniketan, in rural southern Bengal, that he first began to integrate those strands of humanist thinking. Shantini Ketan was discovered as a serene spot by Rabindranath's father, Debindranath Tagore, during his travels in the district of Birbhum in southern Bengal. It's close to Calcutta, it's only 100 miles northwest of Calcutta. Debindranath bought land there 
and built a garden house on it in 1863. He named this house Shantiniketan, abode of peace, from which the place took its name, Shantiniketan. It was there that Rabindranath founded a school in 1901 and later added to it an international university named Vishwabharati and an institute of rural reconstruction named Sriniketan. I shall take you some, through some visual images uh, from archival photographs of old Shantiniketan. It was a lonely spot with open and uncultivated fields stretching to the horizon. A red earth road stretched all the way from Shantiniketan to the railway station at Bolpur. This is the Shantiniketan house that Devendra built in 1863. It has been recently restored, as Ambassador Singh said, as part of Government of, Government of India's um, commitment to restoring the pristine glory of Shantiniketan and its history. The school and university were a dynamic experiment in building a living connection between city and village. Students came to the Shantiniketan Institution from city and village, and their teachers came from different parts of the world. Shantiniketan was surrounded by villages. These were the Shantiniketan school dormitories of that time. I'm afraid they're not quite, quite like that anymore, although there are a few examples of the old dormitories. I mean, one of them, the most historic one, has recently been restored too. Students sitting out in their dormitory. Girl students playing. 1908, that's when he also brought the girls into the school. So 1901, it was a boys' school. 1908, he brought the girls into the school. Village students learning from a telescope. He chose a holistic education at the most basic level to instill cosmopolitan and alternative values from early on in shaping a complete human being who could contribute to a better world. The Shantiniketan human landscape with its Hindu, Muslim, and tribal villages, and their social and racial differences was an authentic picture to give the urban students of his school an education about the real India. Rabindranath was very concerned that the new English education and the creation of a new Indian elite, English educated Indian elite, was kind of dividing the city and the village um, further. The Shantiniketan Institution, from school to university to institute of rural reconstruction, was perceived as a state of creative unity where the students' minds would be freed from blind super superstition and be led to respect human beings, irrespective of caste, race, and creed. 
anniversaries of great men of action and compassion who belong to India's multiple cultures and religions and to the world, such as Buddha, Christ, Muhammad, Chaitanya, and Ram Mohan Roy as the first modern reformer in India were observed with prayer and discourse at the school. And this still continues, this tradition is still alive, one is glad to say. He set out thus to resurrect the best things in the Indian inheritance at the Shantiniketan school, but gave it a universal humanist outlook for a realization of a collective truth. He traveled incessantly for a variety of reasons, no less from his longing to break out of the isolation of being a mere provincial of British India. Wishing to reach out to a larger humanity, he took his own English translations of a selection of his poems to England in 1912, which became his English Gitanjali. From England, he came to America in 1912, where at, the where at the University of Illinois at Urbana, he wrote his philosophical essays, Sadhana, The Realization of Life. He read these out first to the university's Unity Club and then at Harvard University. His Gitanjali song offerings, which is the name, which is the title of the English Gitanjali, Gitanjali song offerings, was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1913, transforming him into world citizenship. When the world war broke out in 1914, he felt a great urge to press for world cooperation, for a brotherhood of nations, like a dream, and wrote essays criticizing war and militant nationalism. These were a collection of three essays, nationalism in the West, nationalism in Japan, nationalism in India, written in English in 19. 15, 1916. During 1916 to 1932, he traveled to 30 countries in five continents and offered Vishwabharati's hospitality to humanist scholars and scientists in those countries. He met world thinkers and pacifists, Roma Rolla, Paul Risha, Bertrand Russell, Gilbert Murray, Helen Keller, Albert Einstein, Okakura Kakuzo, Yone Noguchi. At Roma Rolla's request, he signed the Declaration of the Spirit of Independence in 1919, along with other pacifists of the world. He traveled five times to America in 1912-13, Here are some images from his travels in America. He said in America in 1916, Whitman is your greatest poet. In poetry, one must have the breath of thought, which tells you that the poet has seen deeply and knows humanity. 
Through his work, I know your country, and I catch its heartbeat. Here is a column from the New York City Sun of November 19, 1916, with the headline, Sir Rabindranath Tagore urges worldwide altruism. This is, um, huge audiences came to his lecture. So this is him giving a lecture in 1913, Carnegie Hall in New York. His meeting with Helen Keller. In his essay, Creative Unity, he set out Vishwabharati's program for world changes through efforts at the local level. Remember, Vishwabharati was situated in rural Bengal, very remote, and almost without any resources that we can think of as natural today, it's normal in our lives today. There was a real time in the 1920s and 1930s when Vishwabharati in rural Bengal actually became an active global community. Those who came became part of a felt community, engaging in teaching and research and rural reconstruction and creating works of art unhindered by national boundaries. Here are some images. A Czech Indologist, Vincent Lesny from the University of the Oriental Institute of Prague with Sanskritist Vidushekara Shastri. Shantiniketan students with British sculptor Margaret Milward. Reverend C.F. Andrews taking a Shantini Ketan class. A class with Tanunshan, Chinese scholar. Nurse Gretchen Green from America with Srini Ketan faculty and students. Agricultural scientists from Britain in fact, um, the leader of the Sriniketan work, Leonard Elmhurst, with Sriniketan faculty and students. Learning with Alain Danielou, ethnomusicologist from France. In the last decade of his life, Rabindranath found yet another medium to communicate with the world by turning into an all-consuming painter. His paintings were exhibited round the world. Shocked by the Second World War, he sent a personal telegram to President Roosevelt in June 1940 with the words, all our individual political problems are merged today into one supreme world of politics, which I believe is seeking help in the United States as the last refuge of spiritual man. And these few lines of mine merely convey my hope, even if unnecessary, that the United States will not fail in her mission to stand against the universal disaster that appears so imminent. In May 1941, he wrote his last public speech, Crisis in Civilization, with these unforgettable words. I look back on the stretch of past years and see the crumbling ruins of a proud civilization lying heaped as garbage out of history. And yet I shall not commit the grievous sin 
of losing faith in man, accepting his present defeat as final. I shall look forward to a turning in history after the cataclysm, after the cataclysm is over and the sky is again unburdened and passionless. In concluding this life sketch, we can now say he is poet, novelist, essayist, painter and composer, educator, fighter for social justice, pacifist and internationalist. But the essence of his life's work as I see it lay in his tireless striving for India's entry into the universal. The challenge came to him out of his articulation of an inclusive humanism in his own country's history, which was of eternal value to him. He acknowledged that his country's historic race problem had never been resolved, but emphasized that there had been creative responses towards unity through the centuries. Rabindranath's engagement with the world was an Upanishadic element in his upbringing, which paved his faith in universal man. No wonder he wrote in his book, Personality. From the dawn of our history, the poets and artists have been infusing the colors and music of their soul into the structure of existence. And from this I have known certainly that the earth and the sky are woven with the fibers of man's mind, which is the universal mind at the same time. Thank you very much. Ram, 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 Ram,